welcome to the 31st episode of Aimless Ramblings. Today we're going to be discussing Descent uh, as the theme of our overall conversation, uh, and I will begin uh, by starting with a conception of loyal opposition. Now, the idea of loyal opposition actually is drawn from the 18th century in Britain, um, although it is now widespread in most parliamentary democracies, and it's the idea that the major opposition party, although against the program and maybe against, and not, then again, not necessarily against everything, but against uh, the ideas and conceptions of the ruling government, is not necessarily opposed to a high authority within the state. Um, now, in the 18th century, this was obviously the monarch. So, uh, in the 18th century, when you're talking about his majesty's opposition, it was the idea that although both parties might have different ideas with regards to how they wanted to run the country and which direction they were going to take it, both of them were still loyal to the majesty of the king, in that case, the, the king of the UK. Uh, but the issue is uh, that, as that has been extrapolated out, although I suppose technically in most Commonwealth countries and in Britain as well, it's still you know loyalty to the, the executive power being the monarch, but it's the idea that although you have both a government and an opposition. Both are still loyal to the sovereignty of the nation overall. And so, in this conception, it's the idea that dissent can be something that occurs within a political framework, but it's constructive because all parties still have a common view as towards you know achieving the betterment of the society and uh, the people within that society. It's just they come at it from different perspectives and have, in some cases, radically different understandings of how to go about it. Now, I suppose the first question I was going to uh, throw out to both of you, I suppose, is we have seen the evolution of the idea of the loyal opposition to include uh, you know, the sovereignty of the people, the executive of a presidency, the, the United States, um, and you know, parliamentary democracy as seen in, in most uh, modern Western countries. Do you think, however, that by a cultural organisation such as the politics of a Western democracy being able to absorb opposition and demanding sort of deference to a abstract higher power, whether that be a sovereign or sovereignty writ large, it actually forms a buffer as to true dissent in terms of, you know, radical critique and as such it forms as a, a mechanism of essentially creating a you know an overton window by which I mean acceptable levels of politics and, and, and an artificial construct in terms of what is allowed and those who are unloyal opposition so are seen as coming outside of the system uh, marginalized or do you think that this is a, a pretty good way in which you can actually separate between those people who are engaging in politics to the benefit of society and those who are not. Sam? Well, I mean, in theory, the US's system should also contain a degree of this. And I think, you know, modern US history has shown that there's not necessarily direct punitive measures for people who operate drastically outside of, you know, it's not all about winning. And that's like truthfully the way I've seen the US politics shift in a long time. And we had Tony Abbott, you know, most of his actions in opposition were, I would, in my opinion at least, were outside of, you know, the loyal opposition. It was solely about getting elected. And if he wasn't punished, he was elected. So I don't know. Like, am I misunderstanding your question? It could be. Yeah, I don't think, at least in a lot of modern history, we've punished politicians for acting as a non-loyal opposition. Simon? Yeah, um, I definitely... I feel like the cut... The point where you have to sort of work out this loyal opposition versus just generally, you know, whether it's punished or not, is whether or not it can be seen as almost they're talking about the same thing. Because what, what I've seen in a lot of cases, you have cases where people play 
they're, they, you know, they're just trying to, you know, sort of give our diverse thing, but they're not even actually meeting them on the middle ground to talk about the same thing. Uh, obviously, to harken back to the Americas, um, there's this real, like, serious issue where that through a lot of early history they had two parties but the two parties at least agreed on something in the respect that like you know yes we have different ideas of it but like they at least had some form of common ground to be able to discuss things and i feel like that's sort of deteriorated as one of the parties has sort of gone more and more extreme and there's less and less of that common ground to a point where there's just no common ground at all and i feel like that's how uh, this sort of dissent in if i'm right as a loyal descent is a pretty, a very important element. Uh, Tim. Yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, you both definitely have pointed out, um, the issue of modern reactionary politics. Um, and also I suppose, uh, you know, the increasing fracturing of a common media scape and common reality between different political spectrums. Uh, and, and I think that's a pretty a valuable point to be made. And I think Simon's also tackled what I was going to ask Sam is like, you know, how do you really define, you know, when someone has slipped in and slipped out of uh, loyal opposition? But um, I think another interesting question is that, so you look at a lot of the causes, which are, which, well, I mean, until relatively recently, depending on, you know, some aspects of um, polity, but if you look at like the education systems that the three of us went through, the kinds of uh, people who are lauded as social justice heroes and heroines, uh, whether it be someone like Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, etc. And I know that there are some flaws with individuals in, in that list that I've just listed. Um, at the time, like Gandhi in particular, and like, you know, Martin Luther King as well, like you can look at these individuals and to the societies which they were speaking to in that moment, there was definitely a lot of people who were sitting on either side of the political spectrum in, in the, the dominant societies, be that, you know, British Empire or, or you know, uh, segregated US where they would be seen as disloyal opposition. They were sitting outside that, that window of, uh, you know, the, the loyal opposition because they were advocating for things that would see the breakdown of the societal uh, construct as it was at that particular time. So the same with like, you know, you know, for instance, uh, gay rights uh, through a gay marriage. Now the undermining of the traditional family values. Um, do you think in that case that the concept of loyal opposition is kind of useful outside of its historical specificity? For instance, like, you know, what we define as loyal opposition today will be disloyal tomorrow when the Overton window shifts. I'll throw it to Simon first because he had his hand up first. Um, I feel like the most important note to say is that people like Martin Luther King and Gandhi uh, were distant. Uh, however, if they used uh, a common thing that gets thrown around is the ally sort of thing, I think they're the loyal like element is because they are from the minority group and as such they have that ability that they have enough common ground that they can discuss these things so as such i feel like the individuals themselves sort of just label the dissidents however i think the loyal i, I can't remember the actual term what, what do we call it loyal something rather loyal opposition the loyal opposition is those people that are within the majority who have some sort of connection with it. So, for example, uh, the Allies is this general, like, sort of uh, term that's thrown around a lot. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much my take. Uh, Sam? Um, yeah, I was going to say, essentially, Tim, I guess the points you've made is that because, like, in its most strict definition, right, loyal opposition requires subservience to a greater power, right? You know, be that the crown or whatever. So unless you say that the greater power is the well-being and ultimate benefit of all the population or some such, and even then that's so, like, flippy-floppy, you can very quickly have fascism being, um, you know, loyal opposition. Um, so you could be right, I guess, that um, maybe it doesn't actually, you know, have a place because how could you have that shift to the Overton window, which required, you know, in India's case, the actual removal of the crown, you know, the institution of an entirely different form of governance. So how can you have that whilst being loyal to a form of governance? Yeah, good point, Tim. 
Well, cheers to that, Sam. And I think that actually kind of really feeds well into Simon's uh, discussion because he was going to talk about dissent and forming the margins of acceptable culture. So I'll, I'll throw it over to you, Simon. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, so pretty much this is an extrapolation of the idea that uh, crime in its purest form uh, is what develops the very edges of society because what is and isn't criminal sort of allows us to have where the edges are and they sort of are fluid and they move. For example, uh, as Rosa Parks, you know, did something criminal at the time and as a response that was seen as a justified thing and as such, uh, crime in and of itself had to you know, change. It had to go, well, this technically is no longer considered criminal, and that's the difficulty which comes with crime. I think dissent, in its purest form, is sort of that outer limit, because, like, dissent is a point where it's, and I think we'll be discussing this later about the destructive element of it, uh, it is this hard barrier that's very hard to sort of overstep. Well, yeah, I was actually thinking, Simon, when you're talking about this idea of dissent and criminality as sort of shaping the margins of culture and, and sort of, well, this is what I suppose I was getting at a little bit with that loyal opposition. If dissent is what is shifting the, uh, the Overton window as to what is actually acceptable within a culture, then is the interactions at the margin more important in terms of defining what becomes mainstream than mainstream discourse itself. Like, I mean, we, we see this a little bit when we do the, the history of ideas or the history of science, etc. A lot of the time we are looking at thinkers and ideas which in their historical context were extremely controversial and at the margins. They were things that overturned paradigms and completely shifted the point of discourse, uh, you know, whether it be a, a Newton, a Marx, you know, uh, hell, like even like, you know, liberalism, which is, you know, pretty soft and fluffy nowadays. Well, I mean, soft and fluffy, if not on the pointy end, uh, is at its, t at, in its time and context, when you're talking about like John Stuart Mill or a, a Jeremy Bentham is very radical. So, you know, do we, do we, you think, Simon and Sam, and I'll throw a Sam because you can stand up first, but do you, do you think that really we should be looking to the margins to understand uh, where social norms are going to shift? And also, if if the mainstream is something that is defined by the margins of dissent, can, is there something that we can actually base civil discourse on or, or is uh, you know are we just doomed to eternal – recurrence of constant social uh, strife. Sam? Um, so, first and foremost, I guess, you know, like, it only really looks as though it's these, in science in particular, these big revolutionary thinkers, right? Because we attempt to, like, retrospectively go back through history and um, as ascribe it, but it actually tends to be you've got this gradual build-up. So you've got... <clears throat> sorry. You've got a system of knowledge, right? and you gradually collect um, data points that don't actually go against this. And then you get one person who has put all these inconsistencies together type thing, and that causes the paradigm shift. So it looks as though this one revolutionary person's come through and wiped the floor clean, but actually it's it's been like, you know, a death by a thousand cuts and they're just the tipping point. And I think the same thing probably would happen in social change. So if, you know, we paid attention to the fringes, how many things do you think have happened on the fringes that never left the fringes? It's only once it actually gains momentum. And, you know, so it may look as though it's the fringes, you know, the tail wagging the dog as such. But I think it's only once it actually leaves the fringes, once it only actually gains, like, actual, um, you know, teeth. You know, like QAnon. You know, it looked like it was going to have an impact, and now it's just disappearing. So, you know, it, we could have all been, you know, really, you know, this is the new social way. It's prophets and messiahs again or whatever, but it's just all fallen apart again. So maybe it's, yeah, pay attention to the fringe. It's probably useful. It's like wacky science. Pay attention to it. Sometimes it's relevant. I'd probably say most of the time it's not. Simon? I, <laughs> to extrapolate like to extend from what Sam's talking about in the respects that like some things stay in the fringes and some things become very relevant. Uh, 
I think that's really interesting in relation to, and I feel like I'm just going to cut, keep coming back to the same thing. And, you know, I'm just like, you know, hijacking the podcast, but this ally sort of idea. So the in group, the, you know, arguments say the straight white male, you know, upper middle class uh, representative of this fringe issue allows it to get the traction so it can get the teeth so it can do the thing. And once there's a significant amount of them, and I feel like that's sort of where the things form. Uh, and to go back to Tim's uh, topic of the loyal element, uh, it's this idea of the loyalty is no longer just like a king or whatnot. It's just like sort of weird status quo from the majority. And it's only when members of that status quo majority start to go, hang on, that that's when the sort of dissidence is given teeth. Uh, prior to that, it's sort of seen as this sort of a uh, us versus them sort of thing. It's the been an issue every single time something happens. It was like, wh- why should I have to change? Because, you know, this is, you know, that's their problem, not my problem. And it's only when people from my pro- group come in that it actually starts having any form of effect. Because, you know, it's no longer just some other group. It's people from my group are having this sort of reaction to the particular thing that's being destined. Uh, anyway, Tim? Yeah, it's interesting um, when you're talking about um, you know people in a privileged group or in a in a, in a group of power or a position of power for you know appropriating or co-opting um, discourse or ideas from the margins of society and, and bring it in. I mean, like obviously there's a, a lot of stuff written in critical race theory with regards to this kind of stuff. Not necessarily that I agree with all of it, but it is uh, definitely a very Interesting, and I think it's valid in terms of I think the way that ideas sometimes when repackaged in a uh, more palatable form by a more socially acceptable messiah uh, are more appropriately incorporated. But I, I suppose drawing it back to your original point, Simon, about you know the margins uh, of society being shaped by dissent and criminality, and uh, I suppose a question I would ask. In that case, do we should we sort of see maybe like you know the margins spit out like a whole bunch of random stuff all the time, um, some of which will be, some of which won't be incorporated into uh, you know the social uh, the the socially acceptable center ground. But should we, if we if we're looking to the margins, as Sam said, because you know occasionally there's something important that comes out of it, do, should we really look at you know social development rather than? progressive or you know cyclical or some other model is is it more like uh it's almost like a religious experience you know occasionally a prophet comes in from the desert being the margins the were the marginal groups and brings a message that completely shifts uh you know the societal alignment con- uh, preconceived ideas norms and assumptions um in the same way that you know Numerous, uh, numerous, uh, you know, prophets have come from you know the the Levantine and uh, Arabian Peninsula. Simon, um, personally, I, I feel like it's less that there's one Messiah folk. It's more that that Messiah folk is actually being brought up in a culture. Well, like not even brought up in a culture. It's been ex- like you know experiencing this culture of something that has had enough underswell that they can, you know, collect all this bit, these bits and pieces that individually weren't actually strong enough to be able to be pushed forward. But because they've all been, like, can, distilled into this one individual, when the individual comes forth with their idea, everyone's like, wow, this is great. But really, it's like all the people that met along the way that has the same sort of thing. And I feel less that the borders are sort of this thing that you look at and some is important, some of isn't it. It's more along the lines that these borders are sort of, like, ever-changing. And it's this thing of... The borders, yes, most of it's not going to be useful, but it's important to know what's not useful to be able to make sure that you draw the line in front of it rather than behind it. And it's sort of like there's this lovely border of, you know, what we allow in becomes part of us, whereas what we let leave out is them. Uh, Tim? No, just Simon. Um, it's definitely interesting in terms of like maybe how dissent – can change and shape who we are. But I think Sam was going to talk a bit about how dissent's uh, not necessarily always a constructive thing. Yeah, and like unsurprisingly, I'm primarily in the scientific field. So um, scientific dissent is arguably probably like beyond, you know, taking notes. 
is probably like the most integral part of the scientific process you know like without dissent you don't get new ideas without new ideas you don't have new experimentation to gather new evidence etc etc right you know like Galileo going against the church because his observations didn't match the kind of whatever you know without dissent we don't have scientific progress so what I was it's more so like broadly like you know a conversational piece rather than a rant which is rare for me um, how much dissent is enough in science so um, I was reading a thing talking about um, biochemical oxygen demand in wastewater right so there was someone did a survey where they said to people hey look uh, factory waste with high BOD so biochemical oxygen demand when it goes into streams but is bad and causes environmental harm however it's going to be costly to fix should we fix it you know something like 80 to 90 percent of the people said yeah actually you know it does harm it's worth fixing now, if you ask, you know, another spread of people, but inform them that 2% of scientists disagree with the results, less people are supporting. And now if you say 20% of scientists are disagreeing, even more don't support it, despite the fact 20% of scientists disagreeing with something is actually like incredibly common because, you know, they may disagree that there's enough evidence. They may disagree with the interpretation of the evidence, you know, like scientific consensus is very rarely you know an entire thing you know like if i could look at the evidence, body of evidence for climate change and i think it's probably only 10 13 years ago now that the last like political scientific organization has removed its um dissent from that and yeah we've got you know 40 to 50 years worth of evidence so i guess you know we can't hide dissent. It's functional and it's important. In fact, I'd say it's critical. But how do we have the, you know, the speed to respond to important and sometimes rapidly emerging? You know, look at this pandemic. We followed the science and the economic advice, even though there was nowhere near consent. Tons of people dissented against what we did, but we did it and it worked well. So how do you get the public on board with the concept that scientific dissent is a good thing. Simon? Um, I feel like, and I know this sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it's about somehow putting it into a constructive sense. So obviously, you know, uh, this sort of dissent, as you were discussing, that, you know, yes, 20% don't agree, but they might not agree with, like, there's enough evidence or that the, the way they did it was not the right way. Like, it... It's not that they're going to, you know, it's not a very black and white, yes, no. It's a, well, we went through here and we went, mm, I don't agree with how you did that. Like, I might come to similar results, but I haven't physically done that. So, therefore, I can't agree with it. Um, so, scientific dissent, how to, like, sort of sell it to the masses, the sort of a thing that is all right. Uh, I feel like, and I know this is just the, uh, you know, the motivational speaker in me, but I'm, I sort of feel like it has to be done with respect because the issue is that a lot of this kind of conversation, uh, there's a lot of dragging down, whereas sort of this dissent element, it has, it has to be like a sort of a interaction on the terms rather than the idea as a whole. And that is always a difficult thing to try and sell to people, that, yes, we disagree on this, but it's actually just this bit, and I can't discuss the rest of it because this bit I'm not comfortable with. Uh, Sam? And so then how does that, Simon, um, stack up when you then have people who are uh, dishonestly dissenting? So taking in climate change, right? So um, who are they? Where are we at there? So the last scientific body to accept that climate change is anthropocentric, anthropogenic, whatever, made by us, was the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. Now, do you truthfully think that they had an issue with the science, you know, a genuine, truthful issue with the science? Or does it go against the longevity of their careers and personal interest? So, you know, how do we fix this issue of, you know, okay, so we're going to engage with the people that can be engaged with, but there's an awful lot of the people, population that is very willing 
to essentially lie for personal benefit, which is not surprising. But how do we deal with that and the context of scientific dissent? Um, Tim's got his hand up, so we'll chuck to Tim. Well, I was, I was going to say, Sam, that um, lying lying's part of it, for lying for personal gain, etc. Um, but also, uh, you know, when you're talking about selective interpretation of uh, evidence, which is a very charitable way of putting it, uh, cherry picking and looking and only selecting things that accord with one scientific, and once again, I use that in a very generous sense, uh, worldview, is perfectly exemplified in something like anti-vaxxing. Uh, one discredited paper uh, regarding autism and the MMR uh, vaccine, I'm pretty sure. Please don't crucify him if I'm wrong on that one. Uh, but basically uh, has spawned since the 1970s, 1980s, a, a movement which has probably done the most harm for uh, you know public health and preventative disease uh, as anything else in the Western developed world so far. Um, and maybe this leads back to the idea of loyal opposition. If you if you have to have you know dissent within a community organisation, there has to have there has to be some sort of communal ground by which this dissent can occur. Maybe is that objective truth? You know, uh, like if, as long as we can agree that there is an objective truth, and although you know we may not necessarily have direct access to it and there has to be some interpretation, but we all agree that there is a truth to reach. Is that maybe the point where we can define, uh, you know, a loyal opposition who is a loyal dissenter in the scientific community versus someone who is merely cynical or, uh, you know, so ideologically warped that they can't actually, you know, be interacted with? Uh, Simon? Okay, so uh, this is going to be a weird one because I'm going to sort of discuss it and I'm going to discuss reason why there's like massive holes in it. So the original idea that came up when Sam was like, well, I'm like, well, the thing is you've got to then actually physically go, okay, this is the element of your thing that we disagree with. So uh, let's, for example, say the petroleum people, like, okay, cool. They're like, oh, I don't believe, you know, climate change is the thing. I'm like, okay, well, what of this evidence? So this is, this is the studies we've done. Which elements of the have you got a disagreement with? You know, which, which elements is like, mm, that's don't understand. Like, you know, you're like, oh, it's because the longitudinal study went on. The way that that's undercut is the whole point of science is that you can never be 100% sure. So you can drag this out for as long as you want by just going, well, you know, you need to get more data. And, you know, that can buy you another, you know, 20 years. And as long as you keep on doing that, you can just sort of play the system until, you know, uh, you know it's, you've got your profits pretty much. Uh, and then also there's that sort of idea that like, and as Tim was discussing this sort of like this truth, the issue is that the whole point of science is that you just rip at the truth until you can find something that you can go, yep, this is empirically what I want. So it's, the whole point is that like scientists in most cases won't agree on the truth because the whole point is that's the whole discussion piece. You're not going to have the truth because the discussion is about the truth. Uh, Sam? Yeah, I think you've um, asked the question and answered the question. And yeah, it's exactly that, which is why, um, for instance, climate change. You know, Al Gore went before the Senate or Congress or whatever in the US in the 1980s, 1990s. So, you know, it's been a comparatively well-established known reality that this is what's going on, but incredibly aggressive lobbying by those that are financially interested has set us back 30 to 40 years. So, is the only answer like better scientific literacy? You know, and how do you go about that? Because science is actually quite hard to teach. Because, yeah, I don't know. I got no answers. As we always say, if I had answers, we'd be fucking rich. Hey, Tim? Well, I have to agree with you, Sam, that uh, one, science is hard to teach, uh, and two, we don't have the answers. As in us specifically, not necessarily the answers about climate change, because, I mean, the weight of scientific evidence, right? Anyhow, uh, all I would say is that it seems like dissent is unfortunately inextricably linked with politics. And so... I would disagree with that. Ooh, okay. Well, I'll throw it to you quickly before I finish Just up. Just dissenting. <laughs> you jerk. Anyway, uh, but I would say thank you very much for another interesting discussion. Uh we haven't solved anything, which is as per normal, but uh, I hope that everyone tunes in again next time and we'll discuss something slightly more uh, logical and finishing with an ending.
All right, cheers, bye. This great warrior has left to his martyr lord.